Howard Blumenthal, and we are doing the 44th episode of Reinventing School. And this time we're taking a very different approach. We've been looking at different curriculum areas in the past few weeks, and we'll continue on the next episode looking at foreign language education. But we're beginning to transition now into very different ideas, new ideas, new ways of thinking about what school is, what learning is, what it is we should be doing every day, what ages we should be doing it, how we build communities, that whole area, which is big and complicated and largely undefined, although there's a lot of really wonderful work being done. And uh, one of the places it has grown out of is Stanford University. So with that, I have this vague notion that there is this thing called systems thinking, which somehow overlaps but maybe doesn't with design thinking. And then there's a whole bunch of disciplines that seem to be related like decision sciences maybe, and maybe a whole lot of other stuff. So before we get into what exactly the D school is all about, maybe we could set the stage a bit. So I'll kind of leave it to Laura and Sam to just get us started and begin please by explaining who you are and how you ended up doing what you're doing and all that. Great. Uh, I'll kick it off. My name is Laura McBain. I am the co-director of the K-12 lab um, at the Stanford D School, along with my colleague and dear friend, Sam Seidel. Um, and and we, we work together to use design to discover and uncover needs in education and, you, and work with others to discover and solve uh, challenging problems in education and come up with creative solutions. And so our job is really to figure out what can we do as human beings to uncover the challenges that are facing our K-12 system. And we use design, which is the process of talking to people, getting, finding insights, uh, ideating and brainstorming a lot of cool ideas, testing different solutions, and really working with people um, to uncover and really find out what the best solutions might be, might meet their context. And no, I've been a lifelong teacher and educator for about 20 years. Now, when you say design, you don't mean like graphic design. You mean like theoretical or systems design. Do I have that close? Sam, can you kind of shed some light? Uh, sure. Hey, Howard. Uh, thanks for having us on and not only allowing, but encouraging us to bring along a bunch of our friends, colleagues, co-conspirators. Um, we, we, we mean all of the above, but definitely you're onto something like we're not, it's not a capital D design, literally in the D school title, you'll notice the D is always lowercase. Um, there are folks with those skill sets of what of graphic design, facility design, you know, all sorts of design and, and we are housed, uh, you know, technically within Stanford School of Engineering, um, but you're right on, we're looking at it in a much more holistic way. Um, we are looking at what it means to, at, at a systems level. We're looking at that as Laura was starting to get into the human aspects of design, um, how we create experiences and, and at sort of a, a base level, um, how we develop in ourselves and help others develop the creative confidence to tackle some of the biggest challenges and opportunities that exist in our world, right? So in the K-12 lab, which is, as Laura mentioned, the lab that we co-direct, we're looking at these fundamental challenges to our K-12 system, the fact that um, the system is not working for the majority of students. The fact that there's racial disparity and racism embedded in the system. Um, the fact that there are all types of these systemic inequities um, going on. Graphic design may be a part of how we address that, but that can't, is not going to address all of those challenges, right? So we have to pull on a much more diverse set of tools and approaches um, in order to tackle some of these challenges. And we believe um, that there's a lot of things outside the sphere of design that are needed too, right? So we have a role. Um, and as I mentioned, like a big part of that is build, uh, helping folks in the field build those creative, um, the confidence and also the muscles and the tool sets uh, and the community to go about taking on some of those really big challenges and opportunities. So thank you. Can somebody else in the group explain systems thinking and what that is? Because that may be a new term for some folks um, mm -hmm. and how that might overlap or run in parallel. So can somebody grab that? Sure, I can jump in on that. Um, right, but do it a little more loudly if you can and come a little closer. Sure, I can do that. Um, so systems thinking, 
And who are you before we do this, right? So I'm Darrell Coleman. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of DC Design. We are a social impact strategy and design consulting firm. So we work on uh, redesigning our criminal justice system, foster care, education, healthcare, all these major systems. And we use design thinking and systems thinking as an approach to actually doing that work. Um, I also am the creator of Design the Future, which is our a program that teaches high school students how to create products that improve quality of life uh, for people with disabilities. And so that's sort of the educational ex- uh, you know, ex- side of that whole thing. But systems thinking as a whole is a way of uh, addressing challenges or problems that exist within systems. So if you think of our, our education system is made up of a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of individual human beings who have relationships to one another and who carry out a specific set of tasks and actions Some of those actions end up in great outcomes. Some of them don't end up in great outcomes. So when we think about systems thinking, it's an approach to designing how that system functions by looking at leverage points within it. So where is an opportunity for us to apply pressure to change one thing that might have an outsized impact on the results that are produced in the first place? So there's a lot of overlaps with design thinking, but there are also some differences. The main difference I would describe as being that design thinking is focused largely on human beings. It's about people. Another name for it is human-centered design. So putting people at the center of that process. Systems thinking can focus on people, but a lot of times is looking at the interconnectedness between parts of a system as a whole and doesn't necessarily have to go down to the human level to be applied. And are there other flavors or are those the main flavors? Um, those are two of the main players. There are all sorts of other disciplines, you know, for, for solving big problems. But I think that's really the category that we're looking at. We're looking at a category of what are the systems or the methods for solving problems, uh, big problems that happen in our society. So there's like, you know, there's agile thinking, there's other methodologies that we could bring into this. Um, but these two are, are pretty big uh, in our world. Thank you. So maybe somebody else can answer this really basic question. When somebody says, I'm a big picture thinker, is that code for I'm a systems thinker or something similar to that? Anybody else want to jump in and grab that? I'll, uh, I'll jump in on that. So my name is Kwaku and I don't think those two things are mutually inclusive or exclusive. You can be a big picture thinker, meaning that you look at how a lot of things work together, which I think would tie into Durrell's um, sort of explanation of systems thinking, or you can be a big picture thinker where you're like, hey, here's an interesting concept. I wonder where this might fit in any of these things that I'm doing. So I I don't feel that um, big picture thinking is limited to systems thinking. Got it. Thank you. And Kwaku, tell us about you a bit. Uh, Well, I am currently the director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurial Thinking at the San Diego Jewish Academy in in beautiful, cloudy San Diego today. Um, And so my job, involved a bunch of things, but there's big picture thinking where I get the opportunity to collaborate with people like Laura and, and, and Sam and connect to concepts that are either directly connected to schools or independent of schools, but are running parallel within society that we all feel students should be aware of, should be empowered to have a voice within and also a creative aspect or a creative license within. And then in addition to doing that, I also get to collaborate with teachers take some of this knowledge, methodology, knowledge, methodologies, whatever that I've learned and help the teachers bring it into the classroom to empower students in ways that differ from traditional schooling. So things like standardized tests or something like that. So this all for me falls into the category of, gee, this sounds really cool. How do you learn about it? I'm hoping that somebody who's more on the student side will say, well, here's how it's working for me. I can go. Um, I'm Grace. Um, I'm a high school senior from the greater Boston area. Um, One way I've learned about design thinking is through Design the Future, um, which is Darrell's um, program with his DC design design firm. Um, So I'm a 2019 alum of that program um, where we learned the importance of empathy and empathizing with the people you're designing for, specifically um, individuals with disabilities. So I found that that was a really amazing way to sort of like introduce me to this whole process. Um, 
Why did but you I, want to do this in the first place? Like, like um, what did you want to be when you grow up and then suddenly you're doing this? Right, right, right. Yeah. So I've sort of always had um, like a creative influence in my life from like my grandpa and dad and my grandpa was an art teacher. So I always sort of grew up with that influence. Um, so I've always been a creative person and I sort of wanted to find a way to like turn this, that creativity and that passion for creativity into um, like something tangible that could help people help, help solve a problem, I guess. Um, so I was out at Stanford, um, just like touring and whatever. Um, and I found, I discovered design the future. Um, and then I ended up, uh, attending that summer. Um, and that was an amazing way to, again, turn that passion for creativity into something that I can actually produce outcomes from, if that makes sense. It does, it does, but it raises the obvious question. Is this some, I mean, I'm hearing Stanford a couple of times. Is this something only the smartest people in the world can do? No, definitely not. No, okay. I think anyone should um, be using empathy and learning empathy and learning this design process. Um, I think it should be taught as often and as like far widespread, I guess, as it possibly can be. Um, I think Design the Future is an amazing program um, but it also, it only reaches a small audience. And I feel like if there were a way to um, include that design and empathy in more school environments and just like normalize empathy and that type of um, work, I feel like that would be um, so powerful because right now I feel like it is sort of something that's sort of out of reach. I sort of just stumbled upon it by accident. So um, yeah. Well, one of the questions that comes up a lot for me, because I'm with the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania, so well-being and the instruction of well-being and, instruct, and the use of well-being as a culture versus a course is a question that I ask a lot. Um, is this something where there is a specific set of skills that we're trying to convey and then practice, and then suddenly you're more resilient, for example, or is everything we do related to some form of well-being education? I come down pretty strongly on the, you know, on the idea that it's cultural. And I'm, my impression is that the idea of systems or design thinking is similar, that we wouldn't, that, that this really is something that has to permeate everything we do because it's really more about the way we approach it than any specific subject matter. Do I have that close to right? Owen, you want to jump in here? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, yeah, and thank you again for having us on today. So, yeah, I'm Owen, and uh, yeah, I've participated in uh, Duro's Design the Future and also a number of other programs at UC Berkeley um, focusing on design thinking. I'm a you know, uh, entrepreneur and um, particularly interested in designing uh, for people with disabilities and designing within the medical industry, the medical device industry. Um, and so really what, what you want to do as you alluded to is you start with a problem rather than a solution because um, you know, in, in design thinking, there's a, you know, basically an infinite space of solutions, um, but there's a finite space of problems and so really you want to define the problem um, from as many angles as possible before you even start thinking about what a potential solution might be so describe a problem give how would you define a problem is probably the more accurate better way to say it yeah so i mean there's a i mean so one one problem might be like you know, how do you get more users to a platform, for example? So, you know, you have this problem where there isn't enough users. And, you know, one of those solutions could be, you know, give free pizza to people that want, you know. Another one could be like a financial incentive, like, you know, $5 for every referral. Um, there's a lot of these different, different solutions, but really the problem is, how to get more users. And as you really explore that problem, you might find out, well, nobody knows about the platform. And so that is really a problem that, you know, you can address through, you know, like 
right? I'm getting the word out. So, um, you know, starting that, the, the free pizza solution wouldn't really solve the problem because people don't know about the, this uh, platform in the first place. And often defining the problem, number one, is the most fun part of the process just that because you're throwing a lot of ideas around right but also there's a real joy i think and a satisfaction in refining it to a point where you actually know what it is you're trying to solve and i know that from my life as a as a senior executive at various corporations i would have to endure these hours and hours of meetings where it just like what is the problem you are trying to solve? I understand that we all have a lot of good ideas and you're all very smart and it's a table full of MBAs and all that. I'm like, that's fine. But are you trying to figure out how to acquire customers or retain customers? And if you're trying to retain customers, do you try to retain customers across your whole customer base? Or are you trying to retain customers that buy a lot or are young or live in Idaho or are repeat buyers or tend to spend a lot. So refining it is a big, uh, is a big thing. So Tatiana, go through, well, first of all, explain who you are, but you've been shaking your head a lot. Uh, so give us a sense of what you're thinking about. Well, I do agree a lot. Hi, I'm Tatiana. I am now in California, but I'm usually in Puerto Rico where Laura and I have our little trainings, the conversations. Um, so I really agree um, with one thing you said before too, Howard, about, you know, institutions and how we think about institutions nowadays, because a lot of the things that are self-intuitive and are things that will get us to be happier as people, more effective, more have more impact on each other and, you know, more to the point with the needs we have to satisfy, it's kind of um, shaded by an idea of how institutions operate and how much we deserve as recipients of education. And Owen, you know, said that design addresses a need, a problem. And I would, I would add that it's also for challenges, like getting a promotion is not definitely a problem or, you know, something negative. There's so much positivity to solving and so much in using design thinking for good and for bad, you know, with the purpose to make better. I would say I um, we did a program in Puerto Rico and we introduced design thinking and explorations classes and mentorship in schools. So, you know, anybody deserves to be part, you know, of problem solving because what the system has now done and we take for granted is that when you say the system, what system do you mean? Yeah. Well, most systems, um, educational systems that I've Thank experienced you. because school I was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it goes beyond school. I will say I was born and raised in Greece, and then I moved to California, lived there for four years, lived in Puerto Rico for two years. So I have an, an idea of what kind of other places look like, and all systems really focus on, you know, solutions, because a solution gives some people that, you know, get paid to solve that for you and ability to earn some money for that. But they give you a solution. And if that doesn't work for you, because you don't know what need you're solving for, you have to go to the next solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right. you live so in a chain. Yeah, so sorry. let's see if we can pull this into a, a more and more framework of school, because that's what the series is about. Mm -hmm. But also an observation, I've been working on a book uh, about what school, how, the only sensible way to do school, which I don't think falls into the category of what we do now. Um, and part of that is, the purpose of education, which I will label as the industry that controls schools and schools being the sort of local outpost of where learning for a very particular range of ages occurs. But we do it in a mass production way because we have over a billion kids who are going through this. So you want it to be efficient and you want it to be effective. But what might be efficient for me might not be efficient for you. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you're, you know, let's say you're a student and you are 16 years old. I'm not. Does that mean I'm excluded from learning because that's the way the system is set up because it's inefficient to be training me? So Edwin, what are you thinking? And tell us about you. Um, hello, my name is Edwin. I'm a student. I'm a high school student here in San Diego. I go to high tech high media arts. 
And I come from from a school that's not like a regular school that teaches about the book. They teach, they focus more on like real world problems, and we like have hands on projects. So we, which means Give that we design. Give us an design. example, so we we understand what you're talking about. Um. So when I said uh, hands on projects, which I'm basically mean, our teacher gives us a lecture, but not it's not a lecture that comes from a book or comes from somebody else. It's something that's happening in the real world that we all try to fo uh, focus about, uh, on it, like my whole class. And we kind of started basically studying, studying what, like the meaning of the problem, but we start like doing projects about it. And it takes us like uh, a lot of time Something it takes us a whole semester just to learn about a small a small thing. For but what? We, Give me an example of something you have worked on. Um, something I have worked on uh, has been racism. Like last year, for example, when I was back in school, that I was like that I was uh, I had the opportunity to work with other people, like real close. Um, I work in uh, analyzing uh, analyzing racism, which we basically did a whole exhibition about uh, like racism. We study where racism come from. We study it, like the roots of racism. And basically we would like do, uh, uh, transmit it to people through a painting, through whatever we felt like uh, would represent us the most. So I feel that when I said designed, I call, it's more like calling it learning than just designing something. Got it, good. We have one more person who we haven't introduced uh, and that's, Adi, right? Do I have it pronounced correctly? Yep, that's right. Yep. Um, my name is Adi. I'm a 2019 Design the Future alum. Uh, I graduated high school last year and coming freshman at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and a lot of what I learned from Design the Future actually went towards uh, my keystone, I guess you can say, up until now. I co-founded a nonprofit um, in, my, in the KC metro area when the coronavirus hit. Um, that worked on mass producing PPE and donating those to healthcare workers all around the nation um, from all the way in Oakland, California to the Bronx and New York. Cool. So how is this different from a bunch of projects that are worth doing by groups of students here and there who are working together, maybe with faculty, maybe with community? Because what you're describing doesn't sound systematic, if yeah. I can throw it. it. It sounds like a bunch of really good ideas from people who care, um, who have some sort of a vision. Is there more to it than that? Or is this just a collection of those people? Oh, of so, course. Um, I guess if we talk about group projects and just projects in general as they are today, um, we live in a very, very technical world. And when we get a problem to solve in a group project, we often look at it very linearly. This was a thing that I did all the time with engineering projects before design the future. You've got a goal and you've got a position that you're at right now. And sometimes it's about just finding the most linear path, the quickest path and the easiest path to get to that solution. And sometimes you start to lose sight of everything around that. Um, what systems engineering and design thinking does is it forces you to kind of slow down. Think about the impact of your actions and more importantly, think about how you can make your actions effective. Um, and again, it's more of a lifestyle. It's less of a, just a, a engineering process. When I was doing Design the Future, we were working with a project partner who had cerebral palsy. And um, I was really, I was essentially jumping the gun when it came to prototyping. I wanted to get quick um, onto actually getting to make the actual project. But without, quickly, no? Right, exactly. It, it you know, you, you iterate often, but you have to make sure that your efforts are being used mindfully and they're very deliberate. When we slowed down, when my advisor said, hey, let's look at the problem a little bit more in depth. And we slowed down and we talked to the project partner and said, hey, you know, what can we do to make sure that this solution that we're going to manufacture for you is going to be as good as it can be? We realized that in the hub of trying to get to prototyping, of trying to get to use, you know, all the design skills that we knew, we started to lose sight of a lot of the, the core part of the first issue that we actually set out to solve. And that because of that, because we wanted to get a solution so quickly, we realized that if we had slowed down, we could have gotten a much more effective solution. And that's what we ended up doing. The, the most integral part of design think thinking, in my opinion, is the empathy phase. And that, again, it's, it's, uh, turns it into a livelihood or a lifestyle. When we encounter problems in the real world, taking that empathy phase and understanding the problem, understanding people who are involved with the problem, understanding why the problem is, just as Edwin mentioned, you know, racism, where is it rooted from? That's how you solve problems. 
problems aren't always surface level. It's not always A to B. It's sometimes it's really, really complicated. But when you slow down, when you look at it, you can analyze it. You said, you know, does it take a smart person to do this? Not at all. It just takes someone that's mindful. It takes someone that's engaged in person-centered thinking, thinking about the individual more than just the problem as it is. Because behind every problem, there's a human and there's humanity and there's someone with emotions and, and care that when you get to the root of, that's how you solve those problems a little bit better. Now, Dorel, you, you're involved in a bunch of different kinds of projects at a bunch of different levels. So can you add some light to what Audi said, some examples, some, because the, again, I'm drawing towards, this sounds like more than just systematically approaching a problem and being able to pull a lot of ideas in. Slowing down has come up, empathy has come up, impact on humans has come up, I'm guessing impact and environment and, and all of that will come up as well. How do the pieces fit together and how does what you do, because a lot of what you're doing seems to be guiding people, yes? So yes. So guide us a bit. So I think you, you asked a question before, which was really around, you know, what makes this systematic, right? And um, I, think what, I think that there are a couple ways that we can think about this within the education space overall, about the impact of design thinking as a, as a methodology that people can learn, um, but also about it as a, uh, something that can have systemic impact, right? Um, so Design the Future as a program, right, was created, uh, I created the program, was, was created by DC Design, was developed in collaboration with the K-12 lab at the D school. And um, so it has that sort of common DNA, that, that sort of approach. And I think the common uh, focus in a lot of ways is thinking about what could, what could schools look like? What could K-12 education look like? What could it look like if we were raising a generation of young people who um, not just, didn't just believe uh, that they could change the world, but had the knowledge and skills to go out and do so. And so there's a couple of ways that I think about um, what we're ultimately hoping students walk away with. On, on one side, right, we are thinking about, um, do, you, do, you, do you see other people? Are you human-centered in your approach? Do you see the human beings who, who need help or who are asking for help? And are you interested, do you gravitate toward actually helping them? Right. So that's one element of it. Um, do you recognize that as you go to solve a problem, as you live in this world, as you go to create change in any sort of way or create some sort of solution or sell something or whatever that might be, that it does come back down to people and to human beings. And I think both Grace and Adi are really speaking to um, the, 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 the core values of this sort of philosophy as a whole. How it becomes systematic in a way or systemic in a way is that, you know, Adi took the inspiration and the learnings that he had from Design the Future, and then he went on to print over 8,000 PPE masks for people around the country, right? So there's, a, there's an element to um, thinking about this as a system that's embedded in that. Systems are made up of people who have roles and relationships to one another who carry out repeatable, repeatable tasks. So they carry out those tasks over and over again. In some senses, each person who comes out of a program like Design the Future or others that are teaching design thinking in a very hands-on way, it becomes one of those nodes that is producing those sorts of outcomes over and over again, right? So can begin to create an effect that is repeatable. Um, so that's one side of how this becomes sort of systematic as far as its impact goes in the education space. But the other side, the thing that we need to be thinking about and addressing more is what would it look like to build a system right, within our education system itself that was, uh, that, was, that, was, that was teaching these sorts of insights, these sorts of, uh, of concepts to students all across the country, right, all across the world. And I think that's the area where we're sort of lacking right now. So Design the Future was created as a way of challenging the status quo, in a sense, and saying, well, our current system produces this, but high school students, 16, 15, 17 years old, could be producing these sorts of outcomes if we go beyond the sort of class project frame and we start looking at what does it look like to make this a, a real world issue. So is that there's a, as you were listing the, the elements that would be helpful if students become involved, well, I was expecting you to say permission, agency, the ability and the desire of the school community to have the students do it. So we have a, two different forces here, I think. One of them is the school system, the overall system, its purpose is to get a whole lot of people to learn many of the same things in many of the same ways. The difficulty is students really want to learn lots of different things in their own ways, in lots of different ways. So you have a conflict there. But 
by and large, students are not given the freedom, ability, the right to assemble, the right to free speech, the right to think for themselves. We're actually pretty biased against those ideas because it slows everything down, which is why you can't use a cell phone in class, even though it's a learning device. Laura, your, your hand is up. I never well, did that before, actually. I've, we've done how many episodes? Nobody's ever raised their hand. So thank you. As I think that was from the students here. Like, I, they, they, uh, okay, right. Yeah, as always. I think that's, I mean, part of, I think that we're getting at, and I think I saw Edwin, you know, shaking your head is that like part of the, when what Darrell was talking about, right, is the systems and the pedagogy, but ultimately design is just, is learning. As Edwin already said, is like, it is how we learn. We learn through observation. Observing. That's how we teach though. Well, that, right. That's, but right. we don't know how we teach, but that is how we fundamentally learn, right? So we learn through observation, analysis, creation, and sharing at our fundamental level. That is not, is not design. That's John Dewey, right? That's like a, hundreds of years old. And so really part of what you're hearing from, I think the young people, um, and again, you could call it design, you can call it project-based learning, you can call it progressive pedagogy. The name actually is not the point, right? That it actually is the processes in which young people are discovering the world. But I think more deeply, it is the process in which they're becoming themselves and finding out who they are and who they want to become so that they actually feel they can shape the world. And so like speaking about, you know, a powerful project Edwin was talking about, like seeing, like understanding racism and the capacity to shape it and change it. That is where we want our system to go. And I think as designers in this world, I, I feel like very confident that if someone was really just taking up this work, but they called it something else, fantastic. As long as, right, those students and the experience and the communities are starting to see that you said that they see the young people not as um, containers to drop knowledge into, right, but human beings that they're co-creating and co-learning with right? Because we think about teaching versus learning. And really, ultimately, what we're trying to do is being learning together, learning alongside the teachers, learning alongside our peers, learning alongside our community. I love, love all that. that. And then I go into a school and I hear about state standards and I hear about tests and I hear about evaluation. Kwaku, you're in a position where you have it's not a public school. It's a different kind of institution that you're working with. Can you explain the dynamics of that and then what what are on your mind what's on so your Howard, mind? it's interesting you say this because i've worked in charter public and now in independent schools i've worked in three types of schools in fact this the school i work for currently is a religious institution so that would be the fourth um and it was funny as laura was talking and there was a point that you, that you raised about agency and i loved the example that both adi and grace brought up and it's something I've been turning around in my head for a while. Do we have to give kids a certain amount of time within any type of school setting to have agency to affect change in a world that they're currently existing in? I, I personally, I don't think so. And I think that speaks to what Darrell's uh, nonprofit works on, the idea of empowering kids to have the tools and the process, specifically the human-centered design process and the empathy to understand how to create that change now with the, with the speed at which um, innovation or world is moving, I don't think that kids should be put in a place where they have to sit on the sidelines until we say, all right, you've been doing this long enough or you've watched us do it long enough, now you can do this. But they um, do that all day long, almost everywhere. Now I would push ah. you, who's they? Because it's not K-12, everyone's school. K-12 students in the vast majority of public schools, so let's call that, 50 million of the 70 and change million kids in the United States. But we are, we've been very clever. We've spread our system, as has Britain and other parts of Europe, all over the world. So the system that we have working not so well in the United States, we've managed to put into India. We've managed to put into so many. It, it all looks the same. Yep. And the rigidity, even though the individual teacher is like, absolutely, I give them as much freedom as I can, but I'm limited in what I can do. I've heard that in 20 different countries, in big schools and small schools and private schools and religious schools and all that. There's this regimen that we have to follow and yet it fits almost nobody. So uh, Adi, what are you thinking? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I recently just completed my uh, my mandatory, as you could say, 12 years of schooling here. Um, and I guess what what I found is that it, you you mentioned, you know, we have this issue where people um, don't realize that there's you, you should they don't give students the time to go and explore things or solve problems on their own. Um, and I think the, the reason for that is, is essentially twofold. The first part, and I think the most um, most important part is that we measure success just in our society in, in a tangible manner. A lot of the most important skills I've ever learned throughout my life have been entirely intangible. Empathy and understanding how processes work. I can't measure that on a test. Like, you know, things like the ACT, they measure how good you are at test taking, but they'll never be able to tell anyone how good I am at, you know, understanding processes in the, in the systems or, or in our communities, understanding how I can solve problems. They'll never say that for anyone. But we as a society have, have grown to say these tangible measures, our GPAs, our scores are exactly what quantify us as a student. And until we move beyond that, until we realize that the most important lessons in life are learned outside of the classroom, are learned when do their own individual learning and individual seeking, then that's when we get to the next level of understanding. That's where design thinking is. That's where we understand what we can do with empathy in our communities. And that's how we solve problems. Okay, good in theory. Sam, you're one of the people who's been involved in trying to spread these ideas. So you've got this school thing, you got a billion, a billion and a half, maybe a billion, six or seven kids who are in K-12 education throughout the world. And we're beginning to push now towards 90% participation almost everywhere. Secondary numbers are 70%, 75% in some places. So pretty soon we're going to hit 100% or 95%. And everybody will be going through these very standardized, systematized, high efficiency, low satisfaction approaches. So instruct us. Should we stay there? Is this something that happens within um, institutions because that's what institutions do? Or is there a starting place? And take us through the, the exercise of thinking about this. And uh, I mean, you I, can you I, I have a feeling you can hear me, but not see me. Is that correct? That's true. But we can probably deal with that, I guess. <laughs> Actually, you Sorry know about that. we can't because this is going to be we'll wait till you, your video is up again. Laura, can you answer that for us? And then Sam will jump in when he's visual again. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're talking about, you know, is how do we get people what you're talking about is how you change the system. Right. And I think one of the things I love Kawaku's point is who's they? Because I, I started my career as a substitute teacher. And so I started teaching in a school that 3,600 kids. I taught AP European history. When you talk about high stakes tests, right? That was the environment that I started teaching in. And one of the things we have to start thinking about is where is the agency within classrooms? You know, there's this like mythology that school is efficient. I don't even actually know if schools are efficient. Let's just like, let me just call that assumption out. They appear as to be efficient, but they're actually quite inefficient systems. Um, and so part of like, I think starting to kind of changing the system one is what we're doing right now is through stories, right? It's actually thinking about where the opportunities are that whether it's Tatiana in Puerto Rico, Edwin in San Diego, Kowaku in San Diego, you know, uh, Grace in Boston. But it's bottoms up. And I don't, do you get systemic change bottoms up? It's a lot of scaling you have to do. So Sam, and jump in on, good to see you back. Yeah, thanks. And sorry to disappear okay. right as you were asking me a question. Uh, the, the wonders of technology. Um, I, it's a good question, and it cuts to the heart of the work that Lara and I are leading. And I, I think that the approach that we've taken is some of both. Um, we do a lot of work with folks working within systems. Those are the systems that are running right now that are impacting young people every day. I'm not ready to write that off. I'm not ready to say, no, we'll only work with people who are completely radically outside the system. Um, at the same time, we do some of that too. Uh, working with folks, you know, like Darrell, when Darrell, when you were starting Design the Future, you were, you know, you were, it was a startup outside of the school system. And we, we do see the value in that. We do need that. And then also working with the system leaders. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the most recent projects the K-12 lab engaged in was called Reach for the Upside. It was with district leaders, county leaders, the State Department of Education of California, which is a massive um, institution, 
um, and asking how in this moment uh, where almost the, what was almost unthinkable, I think for most of us before happened and we stopped going to school every day, um, how do, what do we do in that moment? How do we come back in a way that's better, that's more equitable than what was happening before that? Um, and so our approach is like, it's both and Howard, it's like, okay. so we were working with leaders of districts, of counties, et cetera, of large nonprofits. Um, they were on design teams. So were students. So were teachers. So were community partners and, and agencies. Um, ultimately, I think we need all those perspectives at the table to do the kind of design work we need to do. Um, so I would say, you know, we look at it pretty holistically and say to make the kind of change we want to make, we do. We need to be working sort of inside the machine, outside the machine. We need to be bringing people in with different perspectives of the machine um, in order to dismantle some of the, the harmful things that are happening, to identify where all of the really exciting opportunities are and where a lot of stuff has already been figured out and is being done well, but we haven't figured out how, how to like bring that to the system, you know, to the widespread systems level. Um, so, so bringing in all those perspectives is, is key uh, to our strategy and how we approach it. So Kwaku, the, certainly everything that Laura and Sam is saying makes sense, but it feels more like we're trying to work not at a full systems level, let me say it that way. It, 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 we recognize that there are gigantic problems that happen every day that are enormously expensive and are not producing the results that we're looking, it, that we're looking for. How do you even begin to think about systemic change on a large scale? We understand and we've been talking about systemic change at a smaller or more containable scale, but is there a way to do this based upon what you've learned? Or really, do you just have to do it one community at a time? And, you know, if it takes 200 years, that's okay. Well, 200 years would be a really long time. Um, I, it's, 100. Okay, even 100. It is interesting because Laura used the term myths. And it made me, it, 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 it helped me to start thinking about this. I think what, what you're looking for is how does this, how do, how does this change occur even more top down than all of the examples that you've seen today. And I think a, a, a good jumping off point would be how we're aligning the myths of greatness, which is sort of building on uh, the point that Adi made. We're, we're aligning it upon test scores, upon GPA, upon ACT scores. And we're, and we're taking that and we're making that the metric for funding. And the irony of it is, the better you do on a test score, the more funding you'll receive in a public setting. But that doesn't necessarily make you a better person or a better student or even more capable of handling the real world. And to be honest, if you're going to do this, I think this ties into the piece that Sam was saying around the design team that he was working with, with district leaders, with teachers and students, and using the collective of all those opinions to redefine what these myths are. Because right now the myths are flawed. Um, Owen. I know you want to make a point. I have a question for you before you do. How has the system as the sort of formal education system served or not served you? Do you think generally it's been successful or do you think generally it's been a flop? I, I would say, yeah, on, on average, it has been successful. You know, I went to a, a public high school um, and then UC Berkeley. Um, and so I think that, yeah, certainly there, there uh, is a lot of room for improvement, but I think what, what the point I wanted to make is that I think that um, there's a, a shift that needs to happen between um, like outcome-based uh, objective measures, like, you know, SATs, stuff like that, and a shift towards mastery-based um learning and this is an idea that uh Saul Khan of the Khan Academy is a um this is not not my idea and this is some of the work that he's doing with the Khan Lab School in Menlo Park. Um but basically the idea is that you know the objective of learning should be mastery it should be really understanding the material um rather than doing well on a standardized test. Um, a lot of people have problems with 
standardized testing. Um, and you know, the question is, well, which part do you have a problem with? Is it the standardized part or the testing part? Um, and you know, it's like you kind of need some sort of standardization to have a, you know, an idea of you know, who is mastered what, who is doing well at what. Um, but I think that the, the shift that needs to happen in my mind is this you know, really understanding who has a master, what student understands which topic to such a deep level. And I don't think that a lot of the measures that are in place now are doing that, right. no, doing that effectively. Agreed. Uh, Tatiana, you've been trying to get in here. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. All yours. No worries at all. It's actually getting better the more I hear. So um, it's just, you know, change. It always crosses my mind that change doesn't have to be radical to be important, you know, and change happens with with such small, you know, it, you know, notice one thing and make such a small change and you see so much difference in everything, you know, even in education asking more whys and making it a safe space for people to answer and be, you know, be okay with facing the consequences themselves is enough because you, we usually see that students are afraid to face consequences because the consequences are laid out for them already before they even try. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, even understanding that, you know, nothing is said, everybody has their own path. You go into it, you ask your questions, you do what you do and you face what what comes after that, you know? And there's a, a, a place where they can come back to and reflect, you know, and that's design thinking, you know, doing empathy with others, doing empathy with you, asking questions constantly, getting to the prototype, not too, you know, slow, go to it and be ready to iterate. So, you know, we talk about empathy so much, but I would give iteration so much credit in this, you know, in this process too. And it's usually the hidden step because we usually have the five steps and iteration comes after, but iteration is constant and it exists throughout all the steps. And I think the D school has different visuals showing that iteration comes and goes and in circles and it's not a linear process because I could go from empathy to prototype back to ideation and it's all you know diverge converge but every time we're diverging we're exposed and if I feel like a student you know that I'm okay I'm safe I could diverge and I can face what's at the end and come back to what I need to come back to you know that's the most important thing I think for me so uh thank you uh Adi uh, the discussion that we're having is this a typical discussion for design thinking, because it feels sort of all over the place, but it also feels very focused. So are we experiencing something close to what you guys are talking about? Or are we just kind of talking around it? Oh, of course. And I think you, you mentioned this earlier, I believe it was Darrell that spoke on this. Um, it was about being, you know, having a, a big picture mindset, but also having like a, a more focused mindset. Um, and that's exactly what's going on through this discussion. We're talking about something that's so nuanced as, you know, standardized testing as, as school is, but we're also focusing on societal attitudes overall um, and how we approach um, just thinking in general. You know, I've been fortunate enough to have a congressional internship. I've seen the exact things that Tatiana is talking about, how people are resilient to change, even when they grow up to be full grown adults working in, in government positions. They're afraid of taking the risk that it takes to enact change. Because when we're, we're children, we're always taught about, you know, be creative, think outside of the box. But then when we get the opportunities to do that, they're, they're confined in these outlines. Here's an assignment. Here's your outline. Be creative within this outline. That's not called being creative. That's not called thinking outside of the box. That's giving you a pen and saying you can do whatever you want inside of it. When we explore more ideas beyond that, when we, we take these issues and we, we expand them and say, do what you want with it, that's how we change the mindset of prioritizing change, of saying that creativity is not a bad thing. Take risks, learn from the consequences, and use those to improve yourself. And again, that's just focusing on one thing, but it talks so much about the bigger picture. And that's exactly what design thinking is. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, it occurs to me the, the sort of resistance to change. Let's just take that for a second. So I've led a lot of creative projects, very large, very small. When I start a project, I typically take a legal pad, turn on some music, and the first thing I do is I write at the top, givens. 
In other words, what do the baby bumpers look like around this? Because I can't do anything. I'm doing a project that will involve 3,000 people who will gather for a weekend to learn about X. So now I have the box. I want to think inside that box. If I don't think inside that box, we're not going to get the task done. I can play around with the boundaries. I can try to extend it. But most of the work I do has to actually be what's necessary in my mind, in the client's mind, in the partner's mind, in the community's mind, whatever it is. And I have to be careful about the resistance part of it because I know I'm going to get resistance in any new idea or any variation on what they do. And at the same time, they hired me to do something that they don't, they can't do on their own, right? So, and they're asking me to integrate a lot of parts. And that seems to be part of this discussion too. So, Darrell, again, give us a little bit of, I mean, I, I, I'm skimming off parts of this based on what I'm hearing from you. I'm riffing, but you know a lot more about this than I ever will. So please. I think that I think your breakdown there is is 100% in line with the answer to your question around how do you create systemic change as well. So, um, and it, it it is the design thinking way of solving these problems. So the 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 thing that I think we're sort of dancing around here is um, that we have talked at a very abstract level. We keep we keep talking about systemic change. What does it mean to change the system overall? But the question that I would have is which specific things are we trying to change? Like what are the sub problems that we need to focus on? So the example you just gave is one where you draw a box around a sub problem. You say, this is what I need to focus on. There are people who are going to resist that. There are people who are gonna be bought into that. And that's actually the way to create systemic change overall, because ultimately it comes down to power um, in, the, in, in, in creating that change. So you, you mentioned bottom up earlier. Can it be bottom up? Um, it can be. If, but we need to recognize that every individual person, for example, every individual student in the United States has power to create change in the whole system if we want. Let's imagine that every student in the United States, let's make this like really concrete, wanted to change the US history books, wanted to rewrite the history books. If every student- but Actually, let's even be even more specific. Let's get rid of the nonsense about manifest destiny. Sure. Go every ahead. student in the United States wants to get rid of manifest destiny. They, they could, enact that change, they could push for that change. But what is it gonna take for that to happen? Well, they're gonna to need to recognize that each of them has a really small fraction of power. If all the students in the United States decide to stop going to school until, until Manifest Destiny uh, is changed in the textbooks, there's gonna be a lot of pushing back against that. There's gonna be a lot of holding out against that. There's gonna be a lot of conversations about that, but likely they have enough power at some point for that to be changed. Someone will write a textbook, people will buy it, schools will get their students back and, and we'll move forward from there. But I think what I'm really illustrating here is that different people in the system have different levels of power, right? The governor of a state might be able to say, I'm getting rid of Manifest Destiny in all of our textbooks without having to, to have entire school walkouts as we do that. So I think, I think two things that are really important here as we think of how design thinking applies to systemic change we have this approach called multi-stakeholder design, uh, basically, which, which brings together this idea that you need to understand the power of the different stakeholders involved. You need to understand the specific sub-problem that you're working on. Who are the stakeholders associated with that sub-problem that you're working on, right? And what is, do you have an accumulation of power necessary to create the change we're talking about? If you have enough of that power, you can overcome the resistance. If you don't have enough, uh, of, of the accumulated power, the right stakeholders involved, then you're not going to be able to overcome that. You're not going to be able to create the change that you want. Manifest destiny will stay in your textbooks forever. Wait, 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 wait. I, want, I want to take that a little further because Great. It, it seems to me that if you didn't have the power, you would build alliances. Right. Right. Sort of the right. way the Israeli government works, for, for example. Right? All right. So let's use it. Now, manifest destiny did happen. There was a group of Americans who felt that God had, God desired that, that this group make their way from one coast to the other and settle it and eliminate animals and people and take over lands and redistribute it and all. Okay. So, right. and if you were a part of that group and if you benefited from that, you might look at this going, that was a good idea. 
Yeah. Not bad. We benefited. However, if you were, say, a buffalo, you might think differently right. because all your friends are dead. Right. You might not have a great feeling for it if you were a Cherokee. You might not right. have a great feeling for it. And, and, you know, we go on and on. It's an interesting discussion only if you're looking at it from multiple points of view. And then it becomes fascinating and the history comes alive. So do we want to eliminate manifest destiny or do we want to make it so that everybody understands it from multiple angles? And if we do that, what are we not learning? Because that's going to take a lot of time. So like, now how do we even begin to think about this? Well, I think you're getting to the point, which is to say um, you do build alliances. So what I think I would say right now is it's likely the people who would want to just remove manifest destiny from the book either don't have the power accumulated right now to do so the alliances haven't been formed just yet or um, haven't put their efforts towards that specific cause what's a like like what i would anticipate to be a more digestible approach which takes in this multi-stakeholder approach which says this is how you could form alliances would be to say let's change the nature of the solution right and and let's let's backtrack into what is actually the problem here the problem is that manifest destiny caused a lot of harm the problem is that manifest destiny uh, continues forward to be held as a really good thing when it's actually it was a it was a bad thing for a lot of people when it's a more nuanced conversation. So if we go back to the problem stage, right, where we're defining that and we're saying uh, the the actual issue is not maybe that it's in the textbook at all. It's that it isn't nuanced. And then we go even further back and we say, who are the people experiencing this issue? Let's understand their their challenges. They feel like they're being fed a false history. Right. Then we can start to build an alliance that says, well, we are allied around addressing the problem of perpetuating this concept that manifest destiny was purely good. And then they can say, let's add some nuance to the chapters about manifest destiny. Let's add some uh, some additional history from other people who lived at that time. Let's add some first hand accounts from people from the Lakota tribe. Right. Who, who were forced off of their land, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way that I think you create systems change using design thinking. It's by building these alliances, but you need to understand where do people actually stand on this issue? That requires empathy, which is what, you know, what Grace was talking about earlier. It requires us to understand the actual stance of the different people who are making these decisions. It sounds great, but it also sounds like it takes vast amounts of time. It does. Need to get pulled away from other activities, which is delightful, but I think you need then to say, all right, everybody who's doing this, forget about 11th grade math, because we're not actually going to do that. We're going to do multiple points of view in this one little tiny strand of social studies. Now, do we really want every 10th grade student to learn this instead of that? My thinking is no, you probably don't want that. You want a group of people working on this and a group of people working on that. But that means they're not all going to learn the same things. Oh, my God. Right. Like, it, can we possibly exist in a school environment with that. So I want to go to Kwaku and then I want to kind of tie this together a little bit more. So please, Kwaku, yours. I actually wanted to push back a little bit on that last point because you're making the assumption that all learning is siloed. And so if you're learning more of one thing, if you're going into more detail into something, then that's taking away from the time that you would learn about something else. But learning doesn't take place that way in the way that societally we don't exist that way. We don't have, even in this conversation, we didn't set aside 10 minutes for math, 10 minutes to discuss history. And then if the math conversation went over two minutes, now it's only eight minutes of history. <laughs> you know, I understand your thinking where it's, if you're getting this nuanced, what gets lost? Um, but there is, and I think even Edwin might be able to talk about this, what it looks like to be in a school setting where learning is um, is a little more fluid between subjects and it, and is more reflective. It looks like Grace could uh, could speak to this as well. Cool, Edwin, all yours. Thank you. Um, I answering to this question, I feel that um, everyone in my school learns at their own level, so not everyone's learning the same thing. I mean, everyone's learning the same thing, but they are learning at their own pace. So if I am able to uh, understand the topic more quickly than my than my classmate. I'm gonna keep going with my with my like what I'm learning, 
and maybe go back and help my classmate understand what we're learning. That way he doesn't fall behind or she doesn't fall behind and we can like both of us can go together. Cool. Grace was. Yeah, I could talk about this a little bit. Um, I feel like I sort of um, come from like a different perspective. I feel like my school um, does really silo things, um, which is sort of frustrating. Um, like my, I go to Wellesley High School, which is in a suburb of the greater Boston area, which is it's on many lists of like one of the best high schools in the US. We just um, met your French teacher. Last oh no week. way yeah oh, that's so funny oh my gosh Perfect. yeah <laughs> that's great um but yeah but I go I go there and um in that whole school district I feel like has um done a good job with some things but other things I just feel like I haven't learned um like sometimes I joke around with my friends that I've learned more about real life from TikTok than I have from my own school um because they're not teaching us the things we need to actually like survive in the world um and I feel like I don't know. It just, it's mind boggling to me that like the school that I go to is so siloed and so like test oriented and grade oriented, but we don't learn about everything else that we need to learn to survive. And yet it's still ranked to like one of the best, but also like, how do you define that? And I feel like those standards really need to be updated. Um, yeah, that's, that's certainly the impression that I've had doing all of these episodes, but um, and more schools are set up that way. So I'm going to ask the question I might have asked at the very beginning of this uh, of Sam and Laura. So you got this like D dot school. What are you doing? And what did we just talk about? And how does it relate to what it is you do? Because clearly there's a lot of interest here. But explain to us now that we're towards the end of this. What do you do? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> First of all, I just want to thank everyone here, because I think in some ways, Howard, the question has been answered because you're hearing from folks who have uh, connected with our work in one way or another. And that would be a whole other episode probably to go through person by person on this uh, Zoom and, and explain all of the points of, you know, where what those points of connection are. But I think that you're hearing from folks um, in, in our network who are connected to what we do. So you've gotten kind of an organic perspective to put that into some uh, more like, I don't know, stringent buckets than, than the very organic display or, or conversation that you've just been a part of. Um, at the K-12 lab at the D school, and, and we should mention, we're one piece of the D school. Like, you know, you're referring to the D school. The D school has a bunch of different programs that occur. A lot of the questions you have around systems thinking, there's actually an entire other program at the D school that we're connected to and um, involved with called the, um, Designing for Social Systems that thinks very explicitly about what those connections between social systems and design are. Uh, our colleague, um, Thomas Both, is one of the uh, directors of that program has a great piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review about that called Human Centered Systems Minded Design. That if you're like you or any of your listeners really want to go deep on that, I, I definitely recommend and just checking out the work of that program. Um, but the K 12 lab, which is what Laura and I get to direct and how we've come in contact with the folks that you're getting to, to learn from and with today, um, is it does three kind of big things, right? Uh, one is we're at Stanford, we, we serve the Stanford community. We offer classes to Stanford students and often hybrid, you know, partial, you know, groups that are partially Stanford students and partially students from elsewhere. Um, we try to always teach those in an interdisciplinary way, bringing in both faculty and folks from outside Stanford who have different expertise than we do. Um, and then other types of programming for, you know, for and the Stanford community and on the Stanford campus. So that's one kind of bucket of our work. Um, the next and probably the biggest bucket of our work is uh, offering um, design experiences, design trainings, professional learning experiences for students, educators, and leaders in the K-12 sector. That probably primarily is, if you looked at numbers of who attends and participates in those things, is, is teachers, K-12 teachers. But it also includes, as I mentioned, students, school leaders. We had a whole program called School Retool for, that for, you know, for many years worked explicitly only you know, with school leaders. Um, and then district leaders and systems leaders and folks in education philanthropy. And if we, we could go through and share a whole bunch of different things, but trainings and learning opportunities for folks that are out there day to day working at various kind of grain sizes of K-12. Uh, you know, we could call them all systems, ecosystems. Um, and then the third 
um, area that Lara and I spend a lot of our time in is what is the design work that our team is doing? We have a, a small but mighty team uh, in the K-12 lab who are all taking on design challenges and working on them. That might be reimagining what assessment might look like in K-12 to measure things that we really care about, like collaborative problem solving. That might be looking at emerging tech in new ways with a real critical lens around race um, and, and how those technologies um, are impacting students uh, today and who will be <laughs> the society of the future. Um, that might be reimagining school safety and how we approach issues related to um, safety and as you mentioned earlier, well-being. Right. And I, I could go on and on. Right. We have uh, um, an ongoing set of experiments that we're engaged in um, that we feel are things that need to be addressed in K-12 um, that might be a little sticky that, you know, all of which are being tackled in some way or another by folks in, you know, in the day to day in K-12 schools, but that we might really be able to contribute to in meaningful ways, given where we sit um, and collaboration. With, with folks who are doing all types of work on the ground. Um, so those are kind of the three major like pieces of our work, our offerings for the Stanford community, a lot of work with uh, folks doing work day-to-day -day in K-12, and then launching, running, supporting, and then making sure that those experiments that I was just mentioning have landing places out in the world. So who are the collaborators that we're, we're working with who can take those and use them uh, iterate on them and make sure that they have a life out in the field. Because as I mentioned, our team is small. So if we're doing lots of experiments, we can't fully do that for all of those experiments. So that is the work that we do um, in the K-12 lab uh, on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year basis um, that in some way or another, all of the pieces that uh, you've heard about from this wonderful group uh, connects to. And Laura, if you can close us out, it sounds like you guys are having a pretty good time doing this. Are you allowed to do that at school? I mean, Clark is laughing because he's working on a project where we have a, a magazine that just got uh, published called Rep Mag that just won a Fast Company Award that's helping young people learn about technology in analog ways. But I think you know, when we think about this world, and you started this question about systems and design, and I think you know, to, to say it simply, I mean, our job at the D School is to cultivate designers. And we're sitting on a call with people from all over the country. Edwin is at a school that's been that was designed as a design school that serves six thousand students across San Diego. Sixteen schools, a graduate school, K twelve, you know, teacher. Tatiana is literally like revamping systems in Puerto Rico, working with the Ministry of Education right now to reimagine the K twelve in all of Puerto Rico, right? Um, and you've got our students from, you know, Design the Future who are thinking of themselves as designers and Kuwaku who's out in the field, you know, really thinking about how to change the system through technology. And so when we think about ourselves and the work that we do, right, ultimately, and we think about system change or design, the system is designed by people. And if we are all going to make change in this world, we need to think with creative and bold and empathetic ways. And yeah, it's a long game, right? It is a long game. There's a lot of people in it. And there's a lot of people that need to be, you know, uh, you know, influenced and changed and improved and really get excited about it. But ultimately, the only way we're going to get there is by working with people, right, and helping people see the world differently, to raise questions, to learn from each other, and ultimately walk away um, with questions in the way that Edwin started with his office. What is this? What is racism? How do we even understand this? That's a 10th grader talking about deep, complex projects. And that is the kind of work that I think we aspire in the long term, right, is to create a cadre of individuals who not only see themselves as designers, but are capable and excited about changing the context in which they live. Yeah, good answer. Um, thank you. Uh, why don't we just go around the horn once? Either, number one, what is it that we didn't touch on that you wish people knew? Number two, what have you learned overall that you think is just really important that you need to keep in mind all the time. So choose a, choose a question. But um, uh, Edwin, you're on my upper left, so you win. You get to go first. And keep these fairly brief. We'll just go around. Um, sorry, I was having a little bit of trouble hearing you. My connection is kind of unstable. Do you mind if you repeat the question again? Sure, you're hoping I remember them. Um, so question number one was, um, among the things we did or didn't talk about, what do you think 
is important for people to really get, to really understand. We may not have mentioned something. And or what have you picked up along the way? It's like, yeah, I got to keep remembering because that's really important. Either way. Something, uh, something that I feel that everyone should be talking about is like things that are happening around us in our community, in our society. So that's, I feel that's something that people really need to pay attention to what's happening around them and not just like living in their own world. And something that I'm like living with uh, this uh, evening is the fact that there is like ton tons of us trying to make a change for like the future. Good, thank you, Owen. You're muted. Yeah, I think for me, um, it's really just about having uh, uh, the first principles mentality. Um, I think just things change and evolve so rapidly um, in today's world that there's a, a new problem every time you, you know, solve another line or sometimes there's like three new ones. And so um, I think it's very really important to have that design thinking as you, you know, try to implement some of these changes to education, um, you know, like, and just trying to stay one step ahead, you know, like, okay, assume we're successful with this, well, what's going to be the next problem and how are we going to define that and solve it? Good. Thank you. Grace. Um, sorry, there's a dog barking outside. If you I have that. one. Too. Um, <laughs> um, I think I'm just, I'm all about empathy. I think I'm always going to say that. Um, that's just such an important thing to carry with you and make the active effort to learn how to be a better empathizer because I feel like everyone can always be a better empathizer no matter how good at empathy and teaching empathy you think you are. I think it's just so important that we practice that and learn what it is and learn how to use it and learn how to teach it also just so it spreads as much as possible. Sam. Uh, gratitude. Um, just want to thank you, Howard, for giving us, if, not, if nothing else, an excuse to get together with this extraordinary group of folks and just hear how everyone is thinking about this work. Um, gratitude that we, gratitude to all of you for making the time to do that, of course. Gratitude that we get to do this work and think about these questions. Um, you know, so gratitude to all the folks who have made that possible, who have come before us. Um, both like immediately, like folks who have made the D-School and created these, um, you know, structures and, and possibilities to do this work. And also the ancestors, folks who have come before us. And of course, the folks whose land we're on. So just, just great gratitude. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Adi. Yeah, one of the biggest realizations that I had through Design the Future was that, you know, it doesn't take anyone, you know, that's especially talented to make a big change in their world. I was able to use skills that I thought were very, you know, at a beginner level that I just learned in class to make such a big change, even if it was just for one person. It doesn't take you know, anyone insane to do something great for their community. It just takes one person who's dedicated and willing to put in the time and, and the empathy to make sure that they can reach someone that really needs their help. Cool. Thank you. Darrell. Um, that you can change the world is the piece that I would want people to walk away with or that I would, you know, want to emphasize and that um, we kind of need you to. So uh, there are so many problems, so many challenges, so many opportunities. Some of them are, um, they're local, some of them are national, et cetera. But um, this, this call is an example of people who have made the switch from wondering if they can solve problems to knowing that they can, knowing that they can get involved, knowing that they can learn about people and issues and do something about it. And I think we need more and more people to, uh, to believe in that. And so I would just say to anyone who's wondering if they can be like that or they can do that type of work, that not only can you, but um, there are issues that you care about, that you're close to, that you're the best person to actually solve and address. So we need you. Good for you. Laura. I'm going to follow that, Darrell. Um, no. <laughs> um, I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, I just feel really grateful to have this conversation and to see, you know, following up that we're all, that we're all designers. You know, we may not use that term, 
but you know, we all are in the process of seeing the world and trying to make our change in the world and creating something that didn't exi- exist before. And so, you know, as Darrell said, I, I really feel gratitude for this group, but also know that there's so many more out there like us that are doing it. They may not consider themselves the designers, but they're doing the work. And I, I just um, want them to know that they're in this work. They're in the tent with us. And, um, and then there's more to come. Oh, cool. I'm going to kind of piggyback on Laura, um, but I, the thing I think that we didn't talk about enough that I'm so happy that I got to experience today is the, uh, the power and the agency of the students on this call who are driven by human-centered design and empathy and what their un- unlimited potential is, can be, like we're just, we're just scratching the surface with things that all three of them discussed today. And I just love seeing that. As someone who's working in schools, you sometimes get lost in the process. When you get to see it with kids that you haven't even worked with, who are doing things, and you're like, man, that is amazing. You don't want to know what I was doing at your age. That, <laughs> the fact that I'm really excited about what um, kids today are empowered to do and what they will be doing in the future. Tatiana. Well, you know, it's it's just one thing that most conversations like this kind of spark is that, you know, we're here, say, 10 people talking about. Uh oh. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. We're 10 people, and what happens? <laughs> well, we're talking about this, and I can bet there are another, you know, there are thousands of conversations around the same topic. There are people that want to do this. And if you go do about doing something with, you know, integrity and you want to do it, you're passionate about it, you can, you know, I went to Puerto Rico and we know it was new, but we said, let's go, let's do it. And I figured out that's the only way to do anything. You know, there's no other way. There's no theory of what it would look like. Just you have to do it, you know, you have to dive in and you learn that you're never going to do it again, or that there are another thousand things you can do on the same thing or something different. Just dive in, you know, and all of you here do it. So I bet that there's a lot of people that are willing to as well. And a lot of them aren't high school sophomores. A lot of them are second graders and third graders. The lesson I keep bringing into all of this is don't underestimate kids. They're much further along than anybody, right? So to me, that's the, you know, as I'm listening to this, I'm like, I wish we'd talk more about that too. Uh, Anyway, thank you all. Please hang out for a minute after the credits because I want to thank you all. Um, But uh, we would run the credits right now. We'll see you next time. demand episodes and more visit our website kids on earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world learning revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning be sure to join us next thursday for a new episode of reinventing school thanks for watching